these photographs here in order to move into the biochemistry. And that little uh, cells that are all along the leaves are actually the little hole through which CO2 enters into the plant. I don't know how I'm doing with the time. Good? Okay. Um, so, metabolism uh, is required for any living organism. It's basically the chemical controls and pathways that are required to ensure a constant energy and matter flow. So it's basically the rules to make life possible. And those rules have been modified in an important way in the agave plant in order to cope with these conditions. And there's basically, well, I want to share with you three very uh, particular uh, kind of, 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 of ways of doing things in the agave. One is the way uh, the plant gets its carbon from the air. All the plants need the carbon, the CO2 from the air, but it's an uh, uh, interesting way that how the agave does it. The type of sugars are stored. I, I keep seeing presentations where they call the sugar from the agave starches and the starch and the starch. It's not a starch, it's a different one that I will explain to you. And the third one is the, 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 the specialized compounds that are, are there originally to fight against all these uh, microbes and fungi and blah, blah, blah. But then they will provide us a lot of flavor in our final product. So this is a representation. Well, the, the CAM, capsulation acid metabolism, is just like I said about the bird and the butterfly. It's the wings that are shared between the cactus and the agave plant. So they also develop this in a completely evolutionary process, but they reach the same solution. What these plants are doing is instead of getting the CO2 during the day when temperatures are very high and water is compromised because it's become evaporated, if you want to get something through the window, well, there's a possibility something could come out as well. So what these, these plants are doing is they keep closed and sealed during the day when temperatures are high. But when night comes, they open and they start to get the carbon from the air. And through a, a enzymatic process, they accumulate this CO2 in a molecule called malate. And then when they arrive, they close and they make the malate to re-transform into CO2. And using the normal uh, photosynthesis way, the, the photosynthesis is basically coping the energy of the sun, a photon, with a CO2 molecule, breaking down the CO2, you take the oxygen out, you keep the carbon, and then you put another carbon next to it. And the, and the, and the link between one carbon and another is full of energy. So that's oil and petrol and everything is made like that. Well, the agave made our sugars in the same way but taking the problem out of the water. And, uh, and well, those, those, those CO2 are then transforming to these very kind, very special kind of sugars that I will be explaining in a second. Um, but before explaining that, I would like you to understand the concept of water use efficiency. Water use efficiency is a measure of how much water needs to be lost in order to gain a certain amount of carbon. Agave is capable of producing one, well, in this case, blue agave, but in general, agave goes from, from 20 to 40 uh, kilograms of water, or liters of water are lost per one kilogram of sugar. But this is incredibly good. It maybe sounds bad to you, but when you look into, for example, grains, all the, 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 the species that are used for whiskeys or for vodkas or they are three to seven times less efficient, so they need more than 100 to 200 liters of water per kilogram of sugar that is actually there. So uh, being able to use the water of efficiency gives these plants a great ability to cope with, with, uh, with the environment, but also make it very interesting to be used in non-irrigated lands. And now countries like Australia are starting to grow a lot of agaves to make bioethanol and other things. You don't need water, so, or you use very little water. And well, if we go to grapes or fruit, it can go, it's even 26 times more efficient. Uh, well, now we are with the sugar. Starches are made with glucose. Glucose are, are linked one to the next one, and, 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 and those chains can be really, really large. And when they are very, very large, they are not soluble. They make, they make crystals, and, and that's what you find in grains. And all the malting process, for example, in whiskey is about 
first of all breaking this sugar down and then use it. In agave, the sugars are always soluble, and that's really, really important. Because if you need to grow or you need to take a fast decision, metabolically speaking, uh, you need to do that very, very fast. And, and in order to do that, the sugar is maintained in the form of fructans, which are, instead of glucose chains, fructose chains. Uh, I don't want to get too much into this because it's probably a little bit boring, but the important thing is these sugars have a lot of nice properties. Uh, the first one, well, it's very rare. There's the endives or the, the chicory has also this kind of sugar, but there's no many. Um, the first of the nice things is that they provide resistance to, against environmental stresses. This sugar can get linked to the membrane of cells and tolerate stronger, like freezing temperatures or a lot of heat. So it helps the, the, the um, thermodynamics of the membranes in the cells, making it more capable of coping with stress. The second thing, uh, the, well, the third thing is that it cannot be digested by raw, by animals. So this was a great way to get rid of all these big herbivores wanting to eat them, you know? Because if you try to eat the raw sugar, well, you will not be able to digest it because herbivores doesn't have the enzymes to actually use this sugar. The only way to actually take benefit of the sugar is by cooking it, is by breaking it down. So it's also a nice evolutionary solution in order to be away from the herbivores. Um, and of course, these are the sugars who are treated in mezcal and tequila through different systems in order to break down these long molecules into free fructose, and then this is the, 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 the yeast, the one that is going to transform those sugars into alcohol. Uh, well, those are really important because they represent 98% of the thing in the bottle, the alcohol. But then there's other compounds as well that needs to be taken into account. The esters, which are fats, basically, uh, they are very abundant in the waxy surface of the leaf, but also in other membranes. Um, and these, these compounds uh, contribute in a very important way to the flavors of tequila. Uh, the plant is not the only source. Yeast is capable of creating and digesting these fats. Uh, actually, esters are responsible for the haze formation. Some of you may have seen sometimes that uh, you do like this, or, or, or you keep your bottle for very long in a cold temperature, and, and things are formed in the bottle. In whiskey, you can also have this haze formation, and it's the same kind of, of, of compounds. It's actually it's the esters, which are fats in a reaction with the alcohol. I will not get more into that. But well, agave, from, from the beginning is offering a great amount of esters, all different species. Uh, terpenes, terpenes will are sexually used by butterflies, sorry for coming back to the butterflies, but for sexual interaction. So they get attracted using terpenes. But terpenes are very common in plants. When you get into a nice forest and you make a big, uh, like, you, you have a bread, you, you, you start to feel these notes of pine, and, and those compounds are actually uh, uh, fatty, uh, oily, oily compounds that, uh, that have a lot of flavor and, and, and taste. And well, in agave, there has been at least 32 different terpenes in the blue agave, and I think it's around 28 in espadine, that has been isolated and about 50% of them can get into the final product. All depends, of course, how you treat your plant. But, um, so the important thing here is, well, uh, to understand that these terpenes that taste nicely to us are not very nice for microbes and fungi. They don't enjoy in the same way we do this kind of substance. But then, uh, this can explain why agave is one of the most complex white spirits you can actually have. There's other sources for making, uh, for making white spirits that may not provide you with such a great uh, richness of, uh, of chemicals. Okay, once we have understood a little bit where the agave come from and uh, these peculiarities, I just want to give you some examples of how this, all this information is related with the war. Um, 
Well, terroir and cultivation, the way plants are cultivated, have a, a, a great, or could have, depends how you treat the plant again, a great effect on how your product tastes. The, of, of course, the production process has a great deal of that as well. But the important thing is that really, if you use exactly the same way of producing your product, but you choose a gather from different regions, you will have different products. As uh, Thomas says, this, he has a beautiful project. Uh, he, he, he has discovered a lot of on that. Um, so, because agaves are so versatile and plastic, if you put an agave in a slope, if you put it in a, in, 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 in a very high altitude with low temperature during day and during night, things will change. Just to give you a fast list of factors that can affect the plant or that factors that require the plant to adjust its biochemistry, its soil composition, soil capacity, the amount of water the soil can actually retain, temperature, humidity, uh, the rain patterns, the fertilization, the amount of nitrogen in the plant is really important because when we cook, you do this Miller reaction like making bread and the nitrogen and the carbon reacts and, and a lot of different flavors can, can be created there. Uh, all, always, and as well, the pesticides. Uh, if the landscape has a slope or is plain, the distance between plants, the shadowing from other plants, the way the plants are, well, there's many, many things, sorry if I'm being, uh, and the effect in the plant is related with the survival rate, the reproduction rate, the size of the plant, the sugar concentration, well, almost anything. I, I, will, I will try to go faster, and how the clock going? I'm okay? No. Uh, I'm done. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> A little information. Don't worry, you will hear more from Yvonne before we're finished, I promise you. Because that's exactly where we need to get to, right here. The factors that affect what's going on in the glass. Now you've got a little bit more of a scientific idea about what the plant can do and what happens in the plant. And we'll, we'll go back to this. As a matter of fact, we're going to talk a lot about terroir because that's really what this becomes. Uh, Mr. Cooper.